coming to Digital Africa 2020 conference and exhibition. We're about to start yet another and the final fireside chat for this year's Digital Africa. My name is Bosun Ayeni. I'm a Chief Operating Officer of Compumerics and a board member of Digital Africa. I'd like to introduce to you our guest at today's fire chat. He is someone dedicated to building digital economy. And today we're going to be showcasing a success story of how a city has demonstrated that it is indeed possible to have a truly digital economy running within the framework of a smart city. Ladies and gentlemen, Emmanuel Edward will be our guest. He is the program manager and the governance lead at Smart Docklands in Ireland. He is a project manager and governance uh, personality and professional with unique world-class experience in running smart city uh, with a test bed in the heart of Dublin's Dockland area. Smart Dockland is the first of its kind in Ireland and indeed globally, where the municipality, the academia, have funded a project management office to play intermediary amongst government, the fintech, startup community, business owners, universities, research centers, and the citizens of Dublin. This innovative Quad Alex model, and we will be talking a bit more about the model, has demonstrated that it is possible to bring together global partnerships, and they've secured the commitment of participation of Google, IBM, AT&T, Accenture, Dese, Microsoft, Vodafone, Autodex, Mastercard, Intel, and SoftBank. So we have a smart dockland society or uh, city that has pioneered the world's, the world's first neutral host model for 5G connectivity. Yeah, we spoke about 5G connectivity earlier in the session, and indeed, we asked if Africa can run a neutral host model. So it'll be exciting to hear what Emmanuel has to say around it. So Edward has uh, helps to drive the project, ensuring progress, deliverables, milestones are achieved. He helps to shape the process and structures around project management, otherwise known as the project governance, for the wider Smart Dublin initiative. His background is in information technology and management, and he has keen interest in innovative companies and their ability to commercialize product and services. Ladies and gentlemen, joining me for the fireside, fireside chat who is Emmanuel. But just before we go or we start, I would like to introduce to you the Smart Docklands project with a quick two-minute slide presentation that shows us the key success. So the Smart Dublin City is, is, is a smart city that has achieved quite a lot in the world. Uh, the way non received several awards and it's Dublin's first and indeed the world's first smart city based on an exile hub model. Um, do, do we have the slide? Yes, no? Okay, great. So uh, Smart Docklands is the world's first connected business and living district uh, out there in Dublin, Ireland. Next, please. So there were finalists for the World Smart City Award in 2018, uh, finalists in Innovative Ideas Award category, and have achieved a number of successes. So 9% contribution to the GDP, generated GDP of the Docklands, 52 project, 44,000 employed, 26,000 residents, and a 3 billion euros private investment by 2025. That, that's the projection for the project. And like uh, we said earlier, quite a number of partners, all entirely big global names. It, it would be nice to hear how this has uh, worked out. So ladies and gentlemen, I, I like to and, and learn from the experience of the smart Dockland project. So, Imanda, my pleasure to talk to you again. You're welcome. 
Hi, Voshun. Thanks for having me and uh, thanks for the very flattering welcome. I think you've uh, introduced me better than I could have introduced myself. So thank you for yes, that. I have, to, I have to do that, Imanla. You know, you are really, really excited about coming to Nigeria for this conference. And when we then changed to having it as a virtual conference, you, you're still extremely passionate about showcasing the, the success of, of, of the smart dock line. So we couldn't have done anything less. Thank, thank you for, for joining us. Happy to be here. Happy to share, uh, you know, share the knowledge and experience that we've encountered up to, up to date. Okay, great. So as we settle in, I'll, I'd like to ask you uh, this first question. Of course, we are showcasing a success story for digital economy. But your project is a smart city project. So let's first agree. Can you tell us what is the correlation? Is digital economy, can it be used interchangeably for smart city? Or, or, or smart city is just a consequence of digital economy or vice versa? Just, just tell us. what. Yeah, what it's, it's, it's very interesting because... Um, I, um, there is a correlation. They are, you know, they they are. So the smart city umbrella is quite broad, and it can capture many different uh, facets of, you know, uh, society, which also includes a, tr a thriving sort of digital economy. So what you have is very complementary subjects. Of course, you can have a digital economy, uh, a thriving digital economy. Um, supposedly without any smart city elements. And likewise, perhaps say, you know, smart city elements, uh, supposedly without an uh, economy, but they're so complementary and there's so, such a blurring of lines and uh, um, synergy uh, with both. So, uh, for example, if you were a smart city in a nutshell, you know, there are many different interpretations of what it means in the first place. And uh, we have a very sort of simple uh, explanation saying like a smart city is basically helping to improve sort of your, your living and working conditions uh, within that urban environment. And when you look at a digital economy, you know, that is uh, this layer of sort of digital services and products and services that is happening in the area. And of course, you know, with a, a baseline of connectivity involved. So, uh, again, you're powered by your internet and your, your infrastructure. So they're so complementary and there's this blurring of lines. Um, so it, it, again, it can come across as a bit confusing um, on, on both sides. But I say they're definitely complementary and they feed into each other. So uh, if you have a thriving digital economy, you're definitely having a smart city uh, uh, potential and growth there. Likewise, you have the capacity to run a smart city, then you're going to have uh, a digital economy that is moving along as well. Okay, great. Edward, th thanks for that. Thanks for that good start. You know, I, I, like, to, I, I like to keep things simple, all right? Uh, for most people, when you come across someone that, that is smart, you just know intuitively, you just say, oh, that guy is smart. So how do you know that a city is smart? When, when, you, when you get into a city, you live in a city, what would tell you that this is indeed a smart city? So, so what are the pointers to knowing that a city is indeed smart? Uh, interesting question again. Um, again, like, you know, uh, a very common theme is, uh, you know, like we there's this tendency to put technology on a pedestal. And of course, technology is so important, but technology is an enabler. It's, it's there to help solve challenges and, and look for opportunities. Whereas there's, you know, there's a something lying behind that. So technology enables us to do many things, but it's not the, uh, the so-called, the, the be all and end all. You could, there could be non-technological solutions, for example, but the, the smart city concept is that where you uh, effectively harness technology to help address and solve these challenges. So, um, you know, for example, you know, you had uh, guys earlier talking about uh, digital payments. Um, 
again, that is sort of uh, requiring internet infrastructure, a robust infrastructure, you know, uh, a solid sort of back end and, you know, um, uh, lots of layers, encryption going on to make sure that digital payments are going uh, in and out between uh, accounts. So that is something that is uh, sort of pivotal and instrumental and you see that quite synonymously um, as, as part of being smart. So it's just that using technology to enable us to solve challenges and, and you know, take opportunities that are there, that's essentially what it is. Exactly. So a city is smart by the amount and scale to which it deploys technology to solve everyday problems. Okay, so when when I get to a city, I'll go visit the mayor and and tell him or her whether or not the city is smart, based on what I see. So uh, now let's let's get into smart docklands. This is a project you're passionate about. You've been nominated for several awards. You've been finalist at the world stage for Smart City. Can you give us an overview? What exactly is Smart Docklands? What, what, what's it about? What did you do? What are the services? What, what, how did you change the landscape? Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, in a nutshell, Smart Docklands sits under an umbrella of Smart Dublin. So Smart Dublin is an initiative of the for sort of local authorities like municipalities in the Dublin County in Ireland. So the idea was to set up this umbrella of Smart Dublin to help, again, pulling different actors from the ecosystem to help um, solve challenges and and sort of um, grow opportunities. So, you know, there are different stakeholders in the environment, like you mentioned in the intro, you know, you have your universities, your your researchers, you have industry, your business people, you have the public sector, um, and of course you have your everyday citizens. So those those are four key sort of stakeholders in the ecosystem. And at the same time, all of them have their different goals and agendas. You know, they they have different ideas on, on what their organizations or what they want to achieve. So the idea was to have an independent voice, someone who could sit in the middle and start uh, helping to align all of these stakeholders uh, into a sort of general direction, sort of creating those quote unquote win-win scenarios for everyone involved. So that's where Smart Dublin comes in. And then as we dive uh, deeper in, we realized that we needed a a test bid to sort of trial solutions, uh, things that are sort of game changers that could happen, but they need to be tested and really uh, you know, reach a robust stage before you decide to, say, roll them out across the city or roll it out across the country. So um, it's a very, it's a common term. They call it a living lab or a, uh, we call it our test bit. So Smart Docklands was the first smart district that was launched. And of course, uh, we one of the first who incorporated this quadruple helix model, which you mentioned, pulling the different actors and getting everyone to work together because collaboration is the only way that we get to uh, move along. And uh, so with this concept of the test bit, we trial solutions. And if they work, that's great. We find a way to bring that back into the mainstream, uh, move from a proof of concept to, you know, your operations, your business as usual, scale that up, scaling up. And if it's not so good, which we've had projects as well, which don't turn out great, then we have to chop it and, 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 and kill it and move on quickly. So you, you, fail, you fail fast and if things are going good, we try and find ways to make it work uh, on a wider scale. Great, great. Um, you, you, you've introduced the concept of successes, wins, challenges, and perhaps some lessons. Uh, I, I like the fact that you, it sounds to me that you are more a, a business entity, business outlook, because your terms are not a typical city governance term. You're saying fail fast, win quickly, scale up, collaborate. I mean, these are things that a business entity will do. 
So our best is it to run a smart city. Should it be run as a project? Should it be run as a service? Should it be run the way you run a typical city? What is the best way to run a smart city? Because every city will have its own standard governance, usually backed by law or the constitution of, of that state or territory. So how do you run a smart city within the framework you have defined? Absolutely. And that's a, that's a very uh, pertinent question. And you, you see that uh, quite clearly, even, uh, you know, in, in Dublin, you have its public sector, which is like public sectors around the world, uh, uh, probably in in Abuja as well, where, you know, it's very traditional. You have, um, there's no talk of fail fast. It's don't fail at all because we need to get things straight and and things have to work. And, you know, let's not be risky. Um, I'm, uh, you know, things are supposed to function, and, you know, there's a different mentality there. So you have that in all public sectors around the world. Now, there's a concept called open innovation where you have to sort of grab ideas externally. So the public sector traditionally has not been great at that because it's quite insular. Uh, again, I'm, I'm speaking of in, in, in general terms, but it's, it keeps within itself. And then it keeps within this bubble. Whereas, you know, if you look at innovation and technology, it's always been about open networks. It's always about pulling different ideas, thinking laterally. Okay, you know, you've seen this, you know, uh, you know, pulling, connecting the dots. If you see like, uh, you know, how a fast food chain, for example, and how they run their operations and pulling ideas from that and putting it into your, uh, your fintech startup and, and, you know, connecting dots and things that you wouldn't have seen before, that is so, it comes naturally to, you know, the startup ecosystem and innovation space for technology. So the idea for a smart city, at least uh, for us and a lot of players, was to create that sort of spin-off and startup mentality where you could have someone which was separate from the traditional sphere of the public sector to be that face, that interface, to interact with the external sort of uh, space of innovation uh, and technology. And what you have is you have this medium, which is ourselves at Smart Dublin, who interface between all this innovative stuff that's happening in the market to see that back into uh, the likes of a very traditional uh, public sector. So it's a lot of work because, you know, there is that very uh, staunch people are very traditional. And it's like, we're not going to take risks, but you know, if you have someone in that, that role, that autonomous role, like what we're talking about to help feed that back in to, we call it seed it back into uh, the operations, then it, it becomes a very impactful way to run your sort of your, smart cities and your, your improving your digital economies in general. So, so great. You, you, you run the project management office as part of the, uh, and a lead within the project governance structure for smart docklands with the quad Alex model uh, and different stakeholders wanting so many things. Definitely governance is a critical issue. So how have you been able to manage the governor successfully and what successes have you achieved on the Smart Dockland project in this regard? So governance is such a, an important thing and something that we need to re-emphasize because, again, like, uh, I think that's been a common thread with a lot of the sessions uh, that's been happening at the, at the conference that, you know, we're always looking at the governance of things and, you know, whether, you know, it, there's a structure in place, we want to promote things, we don't want to stifle creativity. Um, the governance model that we have is interesting because we kind of use, of course, we try and take best practices from, from say, project management and program management and, uh, again, start to pull from different areas that we can and can pull from the private sector and 
uh, from from startup literature, uh, so to speak. Uh, I think it's an important point to make where we have we we talk about having different points of view on on the table again uh, to bring it back to this quad helix model. A uh, very common you will find in whatever industry, uh, even though I mentioned this for just the public sector, that there tends to be a bubble effect. And, you know, even for tech startups, uh, unfortunately, sometimes it can have a bubble effect where you're just hanging around with your tech startup crews and it's just like bouncing off each other. Sometimes you need um, that diversity of thought. Again, it's not a buzzword, but it's through having different points of view uh, on the, uh, sitting on the table that you be able to see different angles, uh, angles that you might not have seen with your uh, original background. So the governance model is all about that inclusion. Uh, when we we get the uh, feedback from, say, like you know, the researchers and what their thoughts are, we get back. Uh, uh, feedback from citizens, the everyday citizens, who, on what they think or how uh, they would say improve a certain project or uh, see something that's missing. Again, uh, tapping into industry and looking at the the big businesses as well as the small startups and how they look uh, to address the problem. So basically, is getting feedback from different entities and. Uh, try and inculcate that into our program. So we have that in our uh, sort of our steering committee in, in the governance board. We inculcate that in everything that we do. So we always um, see as wide an angle as possible. Of course, there are, there are drawbacks to that because you always get so-called arguments and discussions and like people who don't agree, but it's part of the process. Uh, eventually, the decision maker will have to synthesize all this information. So that's ourselves and chart a cost and uh, take responsibility, having heard all the different sides. Well, you know, Edward, I'd like to ask just one more question around governance. You know, uh, it's the big elephant in the room. Before we begin to bring it home to Africa, how are you able to manage, especially the public sector players, in, 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 in the Alex to seed out that power and authority to take decisions on everything around the city to a smart city governance structure. Uh, is this structure a, a, a private public sector partnership? Is it added by the government entity? How do you take decisions? Is everything always democratic? Because the challenge, the big elephant in, in most smart city, large scale government initiative is that ultimately the chief executive officers who run the public institution want to make the final call. Absolutely. And um, I, again, the, the democratic process is messy. Uh, it's dirty. It's, it's, it's all over the place. But by far, this is where you get to sort of see out and filter uh, all these different ideas and the different angles I was talking about where, you know, we might have completely uh, missed out on something where someone else catches it for you. So it's so important. And, and going on, again, the governance structure has to have, I mean, you uh, if you look at, at a... At a at a board sort of structure, you know, you have non-executives who don't have veto powers, people who are just lending their opinions, but these people can be very influential as well. So the different voices, for example, will feed into um, the chief executive's thought process. And uh, if you have very influential people on the board, for example, if someone who's in the arts industry, who's, sitting on this uh, the board of directors to discuss uh, the next the roadmap and next plans who's bringing a different angle and he's very influential uh, and bringing that to the table then obviously that is going to uh, affect the dynamics of the discussion and help to steer things another way so it's a very sort of um, um, 
behavioral science and sociology elements, I, I would say that there's influences and how to steer things to move along. And it's more, an, maybe it's more an art of a science. I don't know, but uh, you definitely, it, it definitely comes down again to uh, people who are signing off on on the initiative and in for example you're saying the chief executive so he or she has to hear it all out and have uh, courage and political will to uh, sign off on things and even sometimes if it's not the most uh, favorable decision at the point of time if it's the right decision then you have to take the heat and the flack to chart a course and go for it. So there is some political will and courage involved, absolutely. All right, great. So we'll come to the technologies in a bit. But before we go there, I'd like you to share some insight with us around the cost and the benefits. You have listed, and indeed with public information on, on your site, this, the Dockland, the Smart Dockland is indeed a program. You, you mentioned that earlier. And you have several projects running, each of them with cost and benefit, and some you have to kill very quickly just because uh, it's failing. So can you give us some sense? Is this a white elephant project? Is it worth pursuing? Are the benefits enough to guarantee investment in this space? So that's very interesting and uh, often a, a topic that's brought up. Again, I think uh, going back to, let's say, looking at the private, uh, public sector, the, the role of the public sector to, to of course, help uh, businesses and citizens thrive. So even in the Docklands, which was a strategic sort of development zone, you know, uh, the history of that is very interesting. It was made to with a sort of a pro-business policies for global services to attract companies to uh, go there and settle. So it started with the finance companies, the banking industries, and then um, we uh, we had our first sort of major technology uh, client who moved in, and that was Google. I think that was in 2002, 2003, 2004 to make it a, a headquarters there. So setting that environment to invite the right candidates to come in was a, a, a game changer in that sense. So once Google started to come in, then you had the Facebooks and everyone, and then it became a tech ecosystem that complemented the financial services that went on. Um, so in terms, so where we sit, sometimes you, you can't, you, you won't think exactly in terms of what a private entity would be, would think like, of course, the, the lines are blurring right now. What is the return on investment? But there is an enabler effect that we call we call the multiplier effect. Where if we uh, spend now, we get the right people in, the right projects going, which have that multiplier effect to uh, impact on citizens and other businesses. So I give you an example. Uh, it, you mentioned like the whole neutral host and five G. So. We put out sort of a request for information out there. Uh, this was back in 2017 for uh, what we call gigabit connectivity, so high-speed internet. And then we got in contact with this company called Dense Air. They got in touch. Um, so Dense Air are owned by a company called Airspan, and they are owned by SoftBank. So SoftBank is a parent company for this. So they came and checked us out and found that we provided this very conducive ecosystem to come and, you know, uh, test your things, to come and play and to have a very sort of good and a robust infrastructure to try out things. And so with that in mind, they saw, okay, what happened was it, we, it was start, what started as a simple request for information uh, became an investment into from SoftBank, from Dense Air, into the, uh, the Docklands uh, at the tune of like uh, 1.2 million euros. So that's about 1.4 million USD uh, to set up this 5G neutral host network. And all of that was because of all the work prior to make it uh, conducive and to promise that ecosystem to people. 
And, you know, then there's that multiplier effect to come and create this test network. So that's one, one of the examples. So there is, um, you know, others, whether it's our collaborations with our uh, smart bins, big belly bins, uh, again, with the IBMs and Intels. And now we're working uh, with uh, the TIP tele infra, Telecom Infrastructure Project, which is backed by Facebook Connectivity. And that is, again, is uh, building on this SoftBank project of 5G neutral host. So there's all this investment coming in because you had to do sort of the, the, the legwork in the beginning to set this up quite nicely and promise a very conducive ecosystem to uh, move quickly, to, to provide things that are uh, useful for industry players to come in. So it is very important. And uh, and you we we are starting to see this multiplier effect. But again, this is to just promote that, like like the topic of this, the digital economy, to get things thriving. And that is first and foremost where the quality of life and uh, quality of businesses are moving along. So that is our ROI for us. Th- thanks, Edward. Now l- let's look very quickly at at the use cases and the technologies. So, can you share with us some some experiences and, and things you have deployed? How has the Smart Dockland Initiative changed the city of Dublin and assisted in the overall big Smart Dublin Initiative? Um, so, we have uh, sort of three main pillars in, in the Docklands program, which is we call it connectivity as a baseline, use cases, and engagement. So engagement is kind of what I talked about where we're talking to the different stakeholders of the actors to get the different ideas. And then we had the use cases, which is the different project that I talk about and connectivity as a baseline. So connectivity as a baseline is basically making sure that our infrastructure is TikTok in great condition so that anyone can come in and do business and, and, um, you know, work and play. So that means having the whole district wired up in whether you're talking about your low power wide area networks for small data packets, you're talking like your, your SIGFOX, your LoRaWANs, your uh, MBIOT. These are little sensors all over the place giving small data packets for whether it's air quality, flood sensing, or people movement, simple stuff like that where the data packets are small. And then you've got your cellular coverage, your 3G, uh, 4G, 4G LTE. Again, you want to have very robust sort of cellular coverage. You don't want to have what we call black spots in the district because, again, it just doesn't serve the purpose of creating that environment. And then you're, you're looking at uh, your, your backhaul into your data centers, the internet. So we're looking at your fiber optics. Again, we are fully wired up with uh, fiber cables throughout the Docklands. So we're fully uh, covered in that respect. So we're building on the layers to make sure that infrastructure wise, everything is there. Uh, again, we, there's a mixture of public private partnerships there. There's some full public sector works. Uh, uh, quick example, like for fiber optics, it's very expensive to go down that road for the public sector to lay it all out. So, you know, you had the governments who were thinking of doing that, but we had to backtrack because it was too expensive. We can't afford it. We switched tack. We got the private sector to do the investment, but we uh, made an investment in the ducting the conduits. So we had ducting all over in the Docklands where uh, the private sector would have to pay sort of a rental fee, a leasing fee to put their cables through these ductings. So that's our revenue stream as well, which we didn't have to put spend too much to uh, you know, wire it all up with actual fiber. So it's a mixture of public and private, and we had to be quite uh, smart about how we went about this. So again, it's very important to look at all these aspects to have uh, connectivity as a baseline, and that helped to uh, build the foundations of all our uh, projects, which is like your 5G uh, test bed, our smart bins. We're having a uh, sort of our air quality sensors, looking at the emissions from cars and 
how that's affecting us, uh, you know, that's not really great for our lungs and what it means to change to a different side of mobility, moving to what we call micro mobility, which is uh, getting on, say, your electric scooters or your bicycles and having proper infrastructure for that as well. So um, I, I guess I kind of digress a little bit. For, I, yeah. So, let me ask this question real quick uh, on, on the use cases. Is it safe to say that because of all the work you have done, that the impact, the, the global pandemic of COVID-19 did not significantly affect the docklands? Uh, because if you have all of this running, was the impact really bad? So if you're, if you're talking about our internet infrastructure, it held up really well. So if you're talking about companies who are based there, uh, whether it's your HubSpot, Facebooks, your Airbnbs, your Googles, all the guys who are based in the Docklands, uh, we had internet infrastructure that held up. So even if people had to work from home, you know, it worked very well. But the flip side of the pandemic was that, of course, uh, we probably found this uh, all across the world where there was a lack of uh, that dynamic in your city centers, in the office. People were not going in to keep away and keep socially distanced. And that meant that your so-called your brick and mortar companies who serve the office workers there took a big hit. We're talking about people who serve lunch, food, people who ate, the office workers, uh, who drank coffee, other services, um, uh, massages or groceries, everything that were there, uh, you know, there was a big tank and a big hit. And that was a big problem. I think it was a global conversation where we're thinking like, okay, all our frontline workers and people serving at the shops, they, they were the heroes in that sense because for everyone who was in in tech or other industries where we could rely on the internet connection, we didn't have to leave our house. So that is, again, for a certain category and class of people. And there was another group of people who still had to go out day to day and go face to face. So it made us realize that. And it means that we had to get a little bit more inclusive and think about those people as well. Thank, thanks so much, Edward. Now let's, let's bring it home. We, we need to bring it home to Africa. I'm sure you've been looking at the continent. Are there cities that, A, you think can go on the smart city digital economy journey successfully? And are there cities you're looking at or studying where you are hoping to approach for an engagement or a collaboration? So there's definitely uh, things that are happening in the continent, which is uh, fantastic. I think... Um, Again, I think we have to kind of uh, steep this in terms of expectations. So off the top of my head, I think uh, when you think about smart cities and, and, and a city that is moving quickly and fast, then I think of uh, Kigali in Rwanda, which is moving quickly and, it's, and, and moving fast. And they set up a lot of uh, policies and and uh, legislation to help encourage business to come in and to set up and to make it easy to to uh, yeah to deal with deal with services to work and play and so on. So uh, fascinating story and how it's changed over the years and it's still pushing in that direction. Uh, I mean, other notable mentions, of course, you have it in. Um, uh, I think it's been quite hyped, this, uh, your Echo Atlantic uh, off the coast of Lagos. Uh, that one is a lot of, again, public-private uh, partnerships, a lot of investment coming in to create sort of an um, ecosystem, again, where if you set it up correctly, then people are going to come in and play. And, and you want that digital economy, you want that thrive, thriving capability to just see the magic happen you set it up correctly you you get and then you know creative people will start getting together naturally and you start seeing the magic happen um so that's another I'll mention i think uh, there was another um i think it was called konza on the city which is uh is, is south of nairobi that is also another 
uh, uh, huge investments going there to start to create a real technopolis, then it's another one to watch. So these are, I mean, these are the three which I'm, I'm thinking that are standing out at the moment. Of course, it's going to take some time, uh, especially as they're being built uh, in the case of Echo Atlantic. But huge potential, huge promise, and I think it's going to be uh, amazing and fantastic to see. Thank, thank, thanks, Edward. So uh, on a closing note, I, I would like you to share with us your parting shot. What do you think Africa needs to do to have the next? You, you're giving a couple of examples, but are there policies we need to move? Is there a change in mindset? I'm sure you have change management as part of your program management office that you run. So specifically, what would you like to see change in Africa in order to accelerate our smart city journey? Well, I think, I mean, as a continent, uh, Africa has some of the youngest demographics in, in the world. So it's going to have what we call a demographic dividend. Uh, in Nigeria, for example, I think there's like 30 to 40, 40 million uh, young adults who are going to enter the economy. That's a huge boon and it's sort of getting the structures and everything in place for that. Um on, on that note, we have, I think there was a recent sort of uh, signing off of a, a free trade agreement among the African Union to help sort of these cross borders to uh, between different African states to sell services and products. So I think it was uh, being ratified. I'm not 100% sure. I think that we're waiting on one or two countries, but that's going to be a huge boon again where uh, traditionally, it might have been difficult for cross borders. You could have two neighbor neighboring African states and not seeing as much commerce, and instead, you know, there'll be uh, uh, more of a commercial links across the sea to another continent, for example, in in Europe, where you know, just next door, you can create synergies. I think this this free trade agreement is going to be so impactful, and it's going to help. It re-energize the continent. Again, you're going to have your powerhouses in the continent. You're talking about Nigeria, uh, South Africa, Ethiopia, uh, who are going to who are going to be the juggernauts of the continent and lead the economies there. Uh, having said that, you know the larger economies who are going to be the powerhouses will have to. Um, they have different set of challenges from the likes of, uh, you know, for example, Rwanda or even Ireland or where I'm from in Singapore, you know, smaller countries can move faster and move nimble and move quickly and, and uh, uh, you know, set things in accordance to get the right investment quicker. Whereas larger companies will have to do, a, uh, larger countries, sorry, have to go through a bit more of a painstaking motion. So in Nigeria, for example, there's, huge potential for consumption but you know it's it's not going to be the same path for say rwanda to to uh you know completely just liberalize you have to put some protections in place as well and take it step by step but still make it conducive for uh businesses to come in play so you have um, uh, special economic zones already and you have upcoming you know echo atlantic and so these steps are in play to slowly introduce the capital into the country and slowly level up the base sort of class of workers in terms of education and spending to empower your, your consumer market on a local level. So that is happening and it's a different technique from, from I mean, it's different program of, or, or strategy, so to speak, compared to the smaller countries which get to move a lot quicker. So I think it's on its way. We still have to think of, of ways to better harness foreign direct investment for different entities from international uh, companies who want to set up shop and take advantage to sell to consumers in Africa. So they need to be confident to come in so I think there's some work that can be done there, but if you get the uh, the mix right and you have the right political will, then I think you're going to see um, exponential growth. 
Thanks, Emmanuel. Edward, political will was, was the, the last requirement you placed on Africa, and that's where we would like to leave it. Thank you so much, Program and Project Management Lead for the Smart Dublin Project right there in the Bigger Dublin Initiative uh, right there in Ireland. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure talking to you. We'll definitely get in touch with you and create an award winning smart city right here in Africa. Ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. We've come to the end of this fireside chat, looking at digital economy and the success of smart city, uh, focus with focus on the smart Dublin initiative. Thank you so much. My name is Bosmo Ayeni. As we close and move to the closing wrap up for Digital Africa, we are going to be having a quick video highlight of the session by uh, Stephen Ibaraki uh, and, and then the closing ceremony by the chairman of Digital Africa, Dr. Evans Woherem. Thank you for your time. Uh, Emmanuel, please go back, go click on the go to the backstage button at the top right hand corner of.